Hi, uh, I wanted to talk today about a very, very unique bit of recording in the early days, and that is dealing with the Edison Company, and that is the Edison 125-foot recording horn, which is one of the most unique chapters in the history of recording, because it was so unusual, it was such a bizarre concept. However, there are some interesting parts to it. Now, in my years of research, I was fortunate to spend some time with Theodore Edison. And Theodore told me an awful lot about this horn. And he was there, and actually he worked on parts of it for a while. Theodore was always full of interesting stories about this or that. He, he enjoyed talking, and I enjoyed listening. So it was... It was a very good match we had for a while. But the 125-foot horn, as Theodore mentioned to me, uh, came from a point of his father's view of recorded sound. It seems that Thomas Edison felt that music had a tendency to tangle itself, that get to get tangled up, and what you heard coming out of the horn was tangled up music. So he came to this philosophy that sound needed 125 feet to untangle itself. So therefore, what's the answer? You build a 125-foot recording horn so you can record untangled music. Now, I know that sounds a little ridiculous, but uh, we're simplifying it a little bit, but... That's in many ways how Edison would have described it, in simple terms. Theodore said his father did lots of research in books and physics and mathematics, which he really didn't quite understand. And he even mentioned to me that uh, he was sitting there working one day, and Theodore said he walked up to his father reading, and he was looking at a book on mathematics. Got to remember, Theodore... Uh, had a PhD in mathematics. He was very good at it. He told his father there's an easier way to do this. And his father just kind of said, I'll do it my own way. And kind of just pushed him away. So he let him do his thing. And so Edison came up with his idea of a 125-foot horn. Now, what he was going to do with this was incorporate it into what was called the Columbia Street Studios which was on Columbia Street in West Orange. And the Columbia Street Studios had been in use for a while. They were doing recording there. They did experiments there. They transferred uh, the cylinders from the disc starting in 1914 there. So it was a location geared to uh, sound recording and experimentation of. Now, the first experiment done in Columbia Street concerning a larger horn was done with a 40-foot horn. Now, according to the notes I read, that there were different sized horns, too, tried. But the 40-foot horn seemed to be the one that worked the best, at least initially. And so the 40-foot horn was set up within the confines of the Columbia Street studio. When they started building the 125-foot horn, which was fashioned in the machine shop, by the way, and it came in sections that were bolted together, and each section was correspondingly larger until you had a opening bell of near six feet, and it dwindled down to about a half inch uh, in the recording area. So what they did according to Edison's ideas and experiments, was within the confines of the Columbia Street building, they put cow hair on the wall. And there, were, there was cow hair everywhere, and what that was for was to deaden it, so it wouldn't make any noise. Next, they put squares on the floor, one to a hundred, maybe a little bit more. And another thing was this, that um, they put the horn in this place, they fashioned the whole area to be very, very quiet, and Theodore said that he walked in the room with all that cow hair, and the room was dead. 
and he could whistle and nothing would happen. It would just absorb the whistle. And so they set everything up. Now they had to build a building to put the horn in. And then they had to build another building for a recording laboratory. You see, the Columbia Street Studio building was used as the performance building. And then you had the building that basically encased the 25, 125 foot horn. And within that also was a telephone line that ran through. So each side could hear what was going on. The recording area was a smaller building that was to a degree hermetically sealed because they didn't want the weather to affect uh, the recordings because weather had a profound effect on acoustic recording. If the weather was very, very different, it would affect the wax, it would affect the diaphragms, it would affect the way the, the cutter even cut the wax. So uh, trying to keep it stable was very important. So they put this all together, they set it up, they made their first recordings. Ernest Stevens did a lot of the recording. I got to talk to Ernest Stevens in 1977, just for a little while, and had quite a long, gobbly neck. <laughs> he, was, he was well up in his years, but he was very, very proud of what he had done, and called Edison the greatest man. And he said that he played in that room, and... Uh, he would have him go into different squares, starting at one, and play, or have a trumpet, a trumpet player come in and play. And then on the other side, they would record. They made several discoveries with this horn when they put it together. The first thing was it was terribly directional. And secondly, it had an echo, which was a big problem. So they put baffles within the horn to break up the echoes. It also affected the tonal quality to a degree but it turned out that what was really good for this horn was the piano piano perhaps with a few pieces playing with it and uh, they did countless experiments i remember going through notes seeing the the experiment one after another covering the piano uncovering the piano putting uh carpeting behind the piano removing the carpeting uh they did that countless times they also brought in elizabeth spencer and elizabeth spencer was the big deal to edison vocally he liked the way she vibrated in fact he made a study of the vibrations he created through her voice and so she did a number of experiments on the pole the idea was what he was trying to do in a sense um is uh basically try to record a way that hadn't been done before. And what I mean by that is almost in the sense that at the same time, 1924, Bell Labs was working on an electrical recording method, which Edison didn't like anything dealing with electricity, actually, in those later years. Um, and he was trying to get better harmonics and record more. And in many respects, this large horn was pretty good in that regard uh, but it left so many problems and so it was in use from 1923 to about 19 late 24 it wasn't used that much interesting to note that it sat there and was finally dismantled during world war ii and sold for a scrap drive there is a piece of it left actually uh, it was in the machine shop well, actually, the storeroom in West Orange. I don't know if it's still there. But uh, nonetheless, the 125-foot horn was used for many, many different things, different types of recording. Edison would put storage batteries in them at times to see if that helped the recording, or putting ice in there to see if that helped the recording. And it was always the job of Will Hayes to clean out the horn. There's a lot more to talk about with this amazing horn this amazing recording system. Uh, and I guess I'll do it another time because I can see by the clock that I've already talked almost 10 minutes on this. And so it is time for me to say thank you. Hope you enjoyed this little, little talk on a very big